This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everybody. All four of you guys here and everybody out there. Uh, my name is Barry Edwards. I'm the program manager over the OK Screen program. This is Scott Chisholm. He's my predecessor. He still works at the Department of Health, but he's over uh, medical marijuana. That's over. So the website and the email address and everything can remain the same. We are in the process of moving to the Sandridge building. So like I had spoken earlier, our address and phone numbers will change. We will be changing it on all our documents. They'll be changing in the OK Screen program. Anybody familiar with the OK Screen program? OK. Basically, it's a, it's a database program where you actually enter your applicants, your employees, and we run a background check nationwide through SBI and FBI. We also check your registries, and we'll go through that. The purpose of this is to talk about the act, the employees affected, the screening process, what to expect, as well as licensed nurses. I don't know if you heard the conversation earlier about nurses, depending on when they got their license, whether or not they have to go through the OK screen process of printing. Everybody still has to go on OK screen, but nurses, if they receive their license after 2013, they don't have to print. We go by the Board of Nursing for them. So how does this process work? The registry check, what determines the barrier offenses? When can the applicant start to work? If we deny them eligibility, there's a whole waiver process through an administrative judge. So long term care security act basically developed the program. We got a grant, the health department, the state did through CMS to establish this national background check. Prior to that, the nursing homes would do their own background check. So if you were hired in a nursing home prior to May 2014, you don't have to be in the program in OK screen, but you still, when they go for a survey, when the surveyors come there and do an audit, you still have to have a personnel file where the individual's OSBI records in there and a form stating that they were hired prior to May 2014, prior to the OK Screen program. Now, if they leave that entity, go somewhere else, then they have to go into the OK Screen program. Defines what employers are affected talks about all the different providers. It's not just nursing homes, it's home health, office, assisted living. It talks about uh, the registries. It talks about the barrier offenses. What would prohibit an individual from working in that type of setting? And the process of collecting fingerprints and determining the eligibility. Once you enter an applicant into the system, the provider, you take all the necessary information. The provider would then check all the registries. And there's two things that happens. When you check the registries, there's four that automatically do it manually, excuse me, that do it automatically. Then there's other ones that you can manually do. The ones that are done automatically, every month, it rechecks those registries. So if you have an individual that's in there that has a pending abuse allegation, that wouldn't prohibit them from being eligible for working until it's adjudicated, until they actually find them guilty. A lot of times, some of those just go away. But each month, it runs it automatically, and it will send you an email. Whoever did the screening, whoever's in the system for them, will send you an email saying, you need to go check the registries. And when you go to your home screen, it'll have a little note on registries. It'll say one, two, three, or whatever, however many notices you have. The other thing it does is once you check the registries, if they do have a hit, an adjudication, they were found guilty, 
you can stop right there. You don't have to pay the $19 fee to go do the background check. So you don't have to, you can stop the process. It saves you $19. But if they do clear the registries, then you schedule them to fingerprint. Then we fingerprint through contractor identity. They're not associated with background screening, okay screen program. You actually go to their website and schedule. What we do is our system will provide you a sheet authorization to print form, and it has a, a number on it that when you make either you or the applicant will make the, the appointment for fingerprinting, it's a ten dollar fee. Sometimes the providers pay for it, sometimes the applicant pays for it. Depends on how your company is set up. But when they make the appointment, the numbers and everything else, when they get them in identical, their system, it talks to our system, migrates everything over. Your name, social security number, all the identifying information. Okay. So once they fingerprint, they actually, it's a digital fingerprint. The images goes to OSBI and FBI. And typically what happens is when you fingerprint, we get the results back usually within a day. And if there's no hits, we call no hits, there's no charges or anything else, they have a clear record. It automatically tells OK Screen, and OK Screen automatically will determine them eligible. Then it will generate an email to whoever did the screening, your HR staff or administrator or who, and tell you that you have a determination that's made has been made in the system. It prompts you, we don't tell you that this individual is eligible. We tell you you need to go in the system and see what the determination is. Either they're not eligible or they're eligible. Because once you go back into the system, then you need to make them a permanent employee. We'll talk about it. Disqualifying screen background problem. We look at the disqualifying uh, offenses. We'll talk about that. No history, yields, e notification, which I just talked about. So after they take a print, if they're made eligible, because there's no hits, you'll you'll hear about that real quick. But let's say they have a charge on there that may be a potential barrier. A lot of times when we get these criminal backgrounds. It's not clear as to the adjudication. It'll say it was referred to the DA. So we need to find out more information. Did they pay a fine? Were they sentenced? So we then send out an RFI, which is requested for information to the applicant. This process takes a little bit. So we send that letter to the applicant saying that this is a potential barrier that would prohibit you from working in long term care. And we need additional information. Information as to this charge, this, this charge. We won't make a determination of eligible or, or ineligible or anything else until we get additional information and confirmation. Now, if the applicant doesn't want to provide any information, they won't be made eligible, but they won't be made ineligible. But you won't be able to hire them permanently. <clears throat> One good thing about the system is. If I'll just say Sally worked at this facility and they were cleared through OK Screen, OK Screen, once you're in the system, we continuously monitor your background. So if you get uh, arrested over the weekend, we're going to be notified. And if it's a if it's not a barrier, we just discount it. I mean, we don't even care about it. But if it is a potential barrier. We'll monitor it to see what happens. But since we monitor it continuously, if Sally decides to quit this facility or work multiple jobs or work for another facility down the street, when they go to hire her, they enter her information in the system, it'll pop up and tell them that she's eligible to work. So all they have to do is pay their $19 fee. She doesn't have to go back and reprint. Now to run these prints, Cost about $53 to run all these for this whole process. We only charge the provider $19 and we only charge uh, $10 for the uh, printing part. 
That's not, we're paying more than uh, what is actually being charged. I don't know if that will go up in the future. I probably would guess so. With the Act 63, uh, Section 1, 1945, tells the different type of providers that are defined. I alluded to some of them assisted living, adult take care, residential care, nursing, disabilities. You notice here that it also has contractors, serving providers, staffing agencies. We do have some staffing agencies that provide, for instance, uh, rehab services and stuff. They don't work full time at the facility, they might work at multiple facilities. And the staffing agencies would run those individuals and have them cleared. So when you contract with them, you would actually have your contract and you would still have their clearance letter and their consent and everything else on file for if a surveyor comes in to show that they've been screened, that they were screened out of the staffing agency. They're not a permanent employee of yours. They're actually a contractor. Employers shall not employ, independently contract with, or grant clinical privileges to any individual who has direct patient access to service the employer, the recipients of the employer. And I'll expand on that just a little bit. What is direct patient access? It also includes the individual that reviews the medical file, their financial records, and things of that nature. The whole purpose of this act is to protect the vulnerable patients, whether it be financially, physically, uh, in that respect. This direct patient access, we'll get phone calls. If they work at the nursing home, they have to be run through OK screening. Uh, if the hospital has nursing care facility on site, does all everybody at the hospital have to be screened? No, just those individuals that work in that wing. So the administrator would have to be anybody who's subject to reviewing their financial records, uh, medical stuff would have to, only the staff that would be going into that area or working in that area. So if they pull nurses out of the regular hospital over there, yes, they would have to be run through OK screen. So we get a lot of questions and stuff for clarification in situations like that. You'll see here, patients, Access to patients or residents' property, medical information, or financial information. Uh, such term does not include a volunteer unless a volunteer has duties that are equivalent to the duties of direct patient access employer. We, uh, OSBI and FBI doesn't charge us as much to do a background check on a volunteer. Employers should not employ independently contract with or grant clinical privileges to any individual who has direct access. The board or agency that issues the license determines the barriers of crime. For instance, I talked about nurses. If a nurse received their, their nurse license after 2013 and they fall under the barriers the screening of the nursing board. They still have to be entered into OK screen. You still have to do the registry check of your $19, but they don't have to print. Now, some facilities require them to print. And the reason why is once they print, we continually monitor. And if they do print in that instance, and they have a barrier, then we notify the applicant, we give them a form, you need to take this to the nursing board and they're going to, you need to make, we, basically, we want to make sure that they're aware that you have a barrier offense and the nursing board would sign the form, send it to us. So we don't make them, uh, like I say, they don't have to print or anything else because they're subject under the nursing board's regulations, not ours. They still have to be an okay screen. Now, if they had their license prior to that, yes, we're going to screen in accordance to the barriers of the long-term care act. The results of the state national crime check revealed the subject has failed to act with federal state and municipal laws 
or his or her professional license certification of that nature. Barriers. We break the barriers down into two different categories. We have lifetime barriers, and we have seven year barriers. What you see right here is lifetime barriers. They were convicted, pled guilty, no contest, received, received a deferred sentence to a felony or misdemeanor offense for any of the following. These are abuse, neglect, financial exploitation of any person, rape, child abuse, murder, uh, manslaughter. Child abuse come up sometimes, let's say the individual had their child in the car and they have a DUI or something of that nature, they could charge them with child abuse. I mean, there's, there's a whole array of different circumstances that would, that would uh, cause some of these charges. Manslaughter, aggravated assault, Next slide, these are seven years, seven year assault battery. The biggest one that really hits everybody is shoplifting, heavy larceny. Even if it's a municipal charge, they make you pay a $50 fine. That is still a seven year barrier. But what does that mean? That means that after the completion of that sentence, we'll talk about that here in the slide coming up, that they are prohibited from working in a long-term care facility. So seven years after that. So what is the completion of sentence? An individual gets five years incarceration, they go to prison for five years, and they have five years probation. And it's on a seven-year barrier. We count seven years after probation is completed. So they've served five in prison, five probation is 10, and another seven years. 17 years they are prohibited from working in a long term care facility. The person gets a shoplifting charge, they're prohibited from working in a long term care facility for seven years. Now, we are trying, we would like to drop that down to five years. And we would like to discount only count from the date they get out of prison or the date they they, they complete the sentence. Uh, so they pay their fine and everything else they're sent. They get probation because if they go five years and they're they're clean and free and they haven't had any charges, they're probably going to do for a hit. Some people are habitual uh, criminals, they shoplift, they'll have a shoplifting charge this this year, they had one last year, one year before, it goes on and on, so. But now you know, we're also trying to change some of the other criteria, like uh, identity theft. Big thing is, you know, taking the identity, that's actually not a barrier yes. right now. Which we would like to include. Now, it doesn't mean they won't be charged for abuse or something through through uh, like the nursing board and stuff like that, and be get on the registry. That would prohibit them, but not through our system. Right back. That's what I talked about just a little while ago. That. Once you fingerprint in our system, then we continue to monitor it. If you're out of our system and you're not employed for over a year or close to a year over a year, then you'll have to you have to reprint. But as long as they're active and they're employed, we continuously monitor the rat max. Call them rat max. So, like I say, if they have a charge, they're arrested over the weekend. We're going to know about it. If it's a potential barrier, we're going to send that applicant a letter. We won't send the, they should be telling providers, you know, what's going on and everything else. We won't be sending a letter to you guys. 
but we will send them a letter saying, hey, we're aware of this, we're monitoring it. And uh, once you need to let us know about the disposition, what happens. Okay, other employment barriers. Currently the subject of substantial finding of neglect, abuse, verbal abuse, misappropriation of property, mistreatment. That's what I was talking about when it comes to exclusion. It's not in our barrier, but it's in the registries. Those registries that you have to check. Maltreatment, exploitation by any state or federal agency pursuant to an investigation conducted in Title 42. So if they do an investigation, nurse aid, they get on nurse aid registry for abuse or maltreatment or something of that nature and they're found guilty, that would prohibit them from working in long-term care. What is the registry recheck? Like I say, we continually, right now, there's the ones, there's four that are manually done. The OIG registry is supposed to be manual. I shut that off, excuse me, it's supposed to be automatic. There's four that are automatic, let me clarify. There's four that automatically run themselves when you're doing your check, then there's manual ones. And right now I've turned off one of the automatic ones, the OIG, because we found that the registry check wasn't checking a complete an accurate, up-to-date listing. And the way we found that out was we actually went to the OIG website and ran the registry. They were on that, but on our registry, they weren't. So the migration and everything else with our system wasn't working, so we made that manual. That should be fixed within 30 days because we're moving our hosting of our program to another uh, entity that should fix everything. So employment barriers, these are the ones that are done automatically, uh, these three here. Community service worker, child care restricted, sex, sex offender, as well as the uh, CNA registry. The appeal process, when you, by law, you're allowed to hire the individual provisionally while you go through this approval process. And it says you can hire them for 60 days while you're doing the process. Our offices, the Department of Health has extended that 60 days due to COVID because a lot of our fingerprint sites shut down or they're, they're slowed up. They, you have to make an appointment. They don't take as many, so it's taken a little longer to go through the process. So we've actually extended that until they actually get a uh, determination. Either we make them eligible or not eligible. So you can actually hire them provisionally and there's a form that they fill out and you put it in the file. They're supposed to tell you any, any convictions or any criminal activity that they've had in the past. And uh, they're supposed to tell you if they've lived outside the state in the last five years and uh, so you're able to hire them provisionally. We send them, the first letter we send, if they have a barrier fence, a potential barrier fence, we send them a letter saying, hey, uh, you had this deferred sentence, where are you at right now? Have you completed it? This, this, this. And the law requires, it's the applicant's responsibility, not our responsibility to, to, prove that they have completed the sentence, et cetera, et cetera. They, they have to go to the court and get us documents and stuff of that nature. It's not our responsibility to do that. So with that, you have them hired provisionally. We send the first letter requesting information. Once we get the information, everything, we make a determination. We will then send them a determination letter, whether we made them eligible or not eligible. And then you will be noted once we make that change in the system, it automatically sends you notification or the, the provider notification as to what their status is for you to go in and check. Let's 
So we'll go back here. If we find them not eligible, they can request a waiver through the administrative judge. They have 30 days to do that. Remember, I said you can hire them provisionally for 60 days. Once we make them not eligible, you can't keep them employed, except if they file an appeal, you can continue to keep them hired provisionally through the appeal process. Through the COVID, we're behind. And I'll tell you, it's used about 50% are granted an appeal. They may be granted a consent order. For instance, an individual that works in the kitchen may be granted an appeal with no patient access. Or they might be granted a consent order or appeal that only for that facility. If they go somewhere else, then they're going to have to go through the process over again. And typically, an appeal or waiver is not, or even a consent, is not going to be granted unless they have reference letters. You know, they tell us what happened. You know, it was domestic. They have an assault charge, but it was a domestic. You know, my husband did this, and we split up, and he took the kids, and this, this. they tell us the circumstances and stuff of that nature. But they also provide reference letters. So if they've been working for you for the last 60 days, they're doing a great job. We we want reference letters from you. If you're not willing to give them a reference letter, we're not willing to probably provide them a waiver. Now, if they if they quit, you no longer have them, you no longer have them employed. And uh, typically they'll go they can let's say you do the 60 days. You terminate them, they file an appeal, and they're not employed, but they can still go through that appeal process. And then once it's granted, if it's restricted uh, consent, only for that facility, but you, you would have to be willing to hire them back on. Now, we don't tell you you have to keep them, you have to hire them provisionally. We, we tell the applicant that. They'll say, look, they're, they're gonna separate me or terminate me I need this, 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 this. Some providers don't do the provisional thing at all. They say, once your background check comes back, you're eligible, we'll hire you. But some do hire provisional through the process. Like I say, it's it's at, it's probably 50%, maybe a little more than is granted. And it, it determines, we look at, uh, the types of appeals, they might say, well, that's identity theft. That's not even me. There have been cases. I had a female that had murder, two murder charges on it. There was some other individual who was a male, and he was locked up over in Arkansas in the county pending the murder charges. But somehow I got on her record because her last name was similar, was the same and stuff. But it was female, et cetera, that type of thing. So they can challenge the findings on the criminal the criminal act see when they go through the applicant process and they fill out the consent form, it tells them what they can do if there's inaccurate information on here on their criminal backgrounds. They can challenge the results. They can challenge the uh, the registry as well to go through that. But they can request a waiver based on demonstration that the applicant should be allowed to work because he or she do not pose a risk. So we look at that. Yeah, they have a barrier, but do they pose a risk? We look at the time last. The conviction. So if it's a seven-year barrier, if it's a seven-year barrier and they still have one year to go, my office, I can actually administrate them, do a, do a waiver for them if they're within a year of meeting that deadline. They don't even have to do an appeal. We can do that in house. But if it's beyond that, they also look at you know what if they've been clean for five years, no other no other charges and stuff. Uh, maybe they went through drug court, they did all this rehab and stuff, provide all these documents and everything else. From their probation officer doing a great job. 
They have reference letters and stuff of that nature. So that's where the rehabilitation demonstrate character, character references, employment history. Maybe they applied with you under long-term care, but prior to that, the last five, six years, they worked at another facility that was not long-term care. They did a great job. They have job references from there. So all that, we look at the big picture. We look at it individually. We don't just do blanket statements and statements. You know, we know people change their lives, they mature, they get better. And we know that providers need uh, the, uh, the employees and stuff. And, and sometimes they just need a helping hand to continue on. So we looked at relevancy, particularly disqualifying. Remember, I told you it was a domestic dispute, the assault. You know, it's different if it's an assault, you know, husband wife versus if it's an assault on a complete stranger or police officer and or, you know, it all depends on the nature. You know, uh, of course, if they're a caregiver, it could be that they're a caregiver, but they don't fall under one of the the laws to be put on a register for abuse for an elderly or whatever. They were a caregiver. I had a mother that she had child abuse because she was watching somebody else's kids and she had a, a, a medication in the bottle sitting on a counter. One of the kids came up and took it. Of course, she was a CNA and she called emergency and everything else and stuff. Well, they charged her for abuse. And they found her guilty and stuff of that nature, but she'd been a CNA for years. Nothing else in her background. You know, it was an unfortunate accident and everything else. So the judge takes all that into account, makes his determination. We might, we we have an attorney that represents us, and we'll say, look, based on the law, we can't make her eligible, but she's provided job references, reference letters evaluations, et cetera. Uh, a letter from the, the parents of the kid that she was watching and stuff, this, this, this. And then the judge would take all that into account. Personnel file. Consent and release for some reform, as well as the file registry. So when you run, run the system, they'll sign a consent and release form before you start entering into it's like an application. It's all their identifying information. You enter it into OK screen. You save that in file. Once you get the registry results, you print that off. You put that in file. Then provisional employment. If you want to hire them provisionally, it, it lays out what the provisional requirements are. So everybody knows. So at any time, it protects you. Because if you decide after a month you don't want them, they're terminated. They have no recourse. So the form covers you so they can't come back and say, you know, you, you terminated me, violated my rights, you terminated me, this, this, this. The form takes care of that. So you would have that in file. And then once we complete the process and make them eligible, you'll get a clearance letter. We'll show you a copy of the clearance letter. There's a consent form. Visual employment form says, I have not failed, I have not failed to comply with all federal, they, they initial all this stuff. I haven't failed to comply with federal, state, municipal laws. I'm not subject to any exclusions. I'm not on the registry. I'm not currently subject to substantial finding or neglect of abuse. I'm not entered on the community services. I'm not recorded on the child care restricted registry. I'm not registered pursuant to the Sex Offenders Act. I'm not disqualified based on disqualifying criteria. I agree that if the information in the registry screening, criminal history check confirms that I am qualified, disqualified based on disqualifying criteria, my employment uh, contract, clinical privileges will be terminated. I understand that all statements about disqualifying criteria but they don't disclose to you 
or something in their background. And and uh, we haven't made them eligible after the first day after they printed. Then and they said, I don't have anything. You can terminate their employment. This is the registry chat. And it shows it'll have all the different. Uh, this is child care registry. It shows that they cleared right here at the bottom. Results clear. That's just one. You'll see that it shows clear. All of them will print off on one, one form, like a two page form. Here's the clearance letter. You'll notice right here it says, no disqualifying convictions for the above. This final clearance is based on information received nationwide, statewide criminal history screening using fingerprint. Da, 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 da. This notification clearance and final registry report must be available for inspection for the duration of the applicant's employment. When you enter them into OK screen, I, I discussed corporations. If you have five different facilities, five different licenses, and they work at those individual facilities, you have to enter them in separately for each facility. Because if you enter them into one, then that one goes belly up. They're not approved for the other ones. They have to go through the whole process again. So they would only have to fingerprint once. Yeah, you have to pay your $19 fee for each one. The authorizations for employment, uh, we're changing this form up a little bit. Basically, I want to be able to show authorization for, for, uh, for visual employment because the clearance letter finally tells you the employment status. Uh, I know I went through that real quick. The uh, I'll tell you some of the, the quirks and everything we have. If they're already in the system, it's going to pop up and tell you that they're already in the system. One thing that happens is they change their names. They got married or they got a divorce, went back to their maiden name and stuff like that. Once you enter an individual into the system, you do their name, their social security, birthday, you can't change it. So if it's wrong or they're in the system already, you notify us, we can make the changes, we can actually merge the files if they change to a maiden name or something of that nature. They could be eligible in the system. They should tell you what their married name or their alias is on. So you can enter them in there. That way we can find that out. But if you mess up, don't continue on. And don't don't close that out because we're going to charge you nineteen dollars for that. And then open another one. We're going to charge you nineteen dollars for that. Call us. We'll correct it. Now, we request that you keep a copy of their photo ID, their license, as well as their social security card. So if you say, "I put in their last name wrong," or their social security number wrong, we're going to request that you send the photo ID. A social security card to us so we can verify and then we'll take, take care of the system, make the changes in the system for you. Um, some other issues, uh, payment on this, you can, you can pay a credit card individually for each applicant or you can actually batch file them. So when you enter, you can enter 10, 15 into the system after 30 days, you go in there once a month, click on them all, you pay them. You can pay them on a credit card for each check, one or the other. The system right now, uh, if you haven't paid over 60 days, then you're, well, if you haven't paid over 30 days, you're delinquent. We send you a notification at 45 days, but at 60 days, we're gonna lock you out of the system. So all you can do is go in there and pay. And it down below the 60 days. You know, so if you have two that are 62 days, but you have several that are 30, 40, 50 days, as long as you pay those two, you know, you should pay them all off. But, but uh, if you get to 60 days, 
the system right now, we have to manually do this. But once we move it, it'll be automatic. So you'll be able to go in there. All you can do is make a payment. Once you do that, it'll turn it back on. Then you can do your screening process. Also, you're responsible for going in once a year and verifying employment. So when you go in uh, to verify employment, the other thing I'd recommend you do is it has tab where you can actually print off a roster. So if you become an administrator at a new facility and you have an account, you can go in there, pull up a roster of all the active employees that are cleared in OK screen. You can also print off all the employees, the ones that have been separated and everything else for the facility. That'll tell you who in your staff has been cleared been screened to do. I'll get calls from administrators and say, look, I just took this job and I got 10 people that aren't even in the system. And I got three that are listed not eligible. I've got, you know, blah, 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 blah. So we work with them trying to get all that stuff clarified and taken care of. Because if they come in the survey and find that they're not screened and heaven forbid they get abuse allegations or something and you don't have them screened, you didn't screen them, then that would fall back on you for liability stuff. So you don't want to have that happen. Um, I can take some questions. Anybody has any questions? The system, it's statewide or it's, Oklahoma State is running? Like, what if someone's in Dallas for the weekend? We're, we're going to know about it. Okay. We're going to know about it. If they go, if they go nationwide, it's a wrap back. It's a, uh, FBI, the National Crime uh, Information Center, NCIC, they, uh, like I say, if you get a charge, it's going to pop up and come tell us. If they, if an individual has a warrant, I talked about this earlier before the class, if an individual has a warrant, if it's not a, if it's a warrant for not paying their tickets, their, their uh, parking tickets and stuff, we don't pay attention to it, but we're going to know about it. But if it's a warrant for a potential barrier offense, then we're going to send a letter to the applicant saying, you have a warrant out of the county for this. This is a potential barrier offense. We're monitoring it for disposition. You need to provide information to this office as to the status, et cetera, et cetera. What we want to do is amend the law that you don't hire an individual that has a warrant for a barrier offense. I got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, you're, I understand that you're showing all criminal uh, accountabilities and stuff. What happens to the, the people who get on like the child abuse registry but never go to court but they're confirmed for abuse, neglect, or exploitation in the group homes or for the, for the juvenile system? Do you cross check for those confirmations too or? Is that just if they abuse somebody in a group home and for pediatrics, they're clear to go to um, uh, the elderly? I know the registry that you're talking about. Uh, it deals with uh, it deals with uh, juveniles, specifically juveniles and juvenile correct. That I, I don't know for sure. Um, I'm not sure if that's a a. One of the registries you can manually check. That, All right. I'll have to get a question. I'll try to get it back to Z, get an answer back to Z for you. Yeah, and I and I have uh, as an ex child welfare worker, I, I did know a lot of people get confirmed on abusing their children, but never go to trial because it's just the way the court system is made up. So that's you know, well, that even for. I'm pretty sure it would be on the child abuse registry because that's they don't go to trial to be on the child abuse registry. Well, you're, you're right. Yes, you're right. It would be. Yes. The child abuse registry. If they were convicted, there would be a barrier. Right. Child would, have, would be on their criminal history. Stuff. So that's why you, it, it's very important that you run those registries and that you monitor your home page and see if there's any uh, notices for registries. And it wouldn't hurt to go in there. You can run them as many times as you want. 
stuff. It's going to protect you, your liability and stuff. Any other questions? Suppose um, <clears throat> you have like situation where like um, two CMAs you know, got to all live together, that kind of thing. And uh, domestic situation. Would that fall under the step deal or, or what? Do they go to court and be found guilty? I believe they cleared it. Yeah, they go to court, and a lot of times they give them an attorney, and they know they're a CNA. They'll go to the judge and say, "Look, you know, if this goes on their record, they're going to lose their job. You know, this is a barrier fence. This, this is a lot of times the judge will work with them and say, okay, pay a hundred, a thousand dollar fine, uh, and a uh, deferred sentence, and it's over with, I'm done." So they have to communicate that through the process. But if they're found guilty, they're on a criminal history record, then yes, that would be a barrier offense. They'd have to go through the process and appeal it. Well, like I said, we have a 1-800 number, as well as the, the OK Screen website. Our OK Screen website has a lot of information on it. It has a manual. How to use the OK Screen program. <coughs> Excuse me. How to use the OK Screen program. It has all the disqualifying offenses. It tells you a little bit about the program, uh, how it was developed. Most all states have a form of this. Many of this uh, developed our program for us. They actually did. They have Oregon, Kansas. Alabama, they have like four or five states that they they host on their servers throughout of Atlanta that they do. But most we actually have a forum that the National Background Check Program is called the National Background Check Forum that we all are members of, so we can talk back and forth. So if there's any issues and stuff, there's similar laws pretty much in every state. The whole thing is to protect vulnerable, vulnerable patients, uh, individuals. I have, like I said, we're getting ready to, the information that you have, the website address shouldn't change. The email address is okscreen at health.ok.gov. That should not change, but our 1-800 our number is gonna change. Our other phone number is gonna change. Our address is gonna change. But what we will do is we'll push that out. We actually have the capability of every, any user in the OK Screen program, I can send the mass email out to all of them. I can also put it on the front page when you pull up the program and it'll tell you information. Uh, for instance, when we were going through this COVID stuff, we actually had to switch over to name-based checks. Let me talk about name-based checks. Typically, we don't do a name-based background check on anybody. And the reason why, the main reason is it's not fingerprint-based. It only, only encompasses the state of Oklahoma. So if the person has charges, convictions outside of the state of Oklahoma, we won't know. And we don't continue, we can't continually monitor the background. So we don't get anything from the FBI, from the other states or anything else. So during the COVID, when they shut down all the fingerprint sites, they still needed workers. You know, a lot of people quit working. They didn't want to expose themselves and the loved ones and everything else. They lost a lot of employees, but they were trying to hire. So we had to have some type of a background check. So we went to name-based background checks. And what that did was you still have to pay your $19 fee, but they didn't have to fingerprint because we couldn't fingerprint. But typically, the only time we do name-based checks is if an individual who tries to print, they print twice and it's rejected, then we go do manual prints. Because remember I told you, they do electronic prints. That doesn't work, they do manual prints. So you have to go to OSBI, Sheriff's Department stuff, actually do ink cards, that's the third time. If it still doesn't take, 
And that's when we do a name based check. And that is typically for elderly individuals. As you get older, you know, somebody's 70 or whatever, and they're volunteering at the nursing home and stuff like that. Those individuals, their fingerprints aren't as readable. So we do that. With that being said, during the COVID epidemic, we switched over to name based checks. And that only checked Oklahoma. So what I told the providers that once the fingerprint site, site opens up, you can still have the fingerprint. And that will do a more thorough check. And I encourage you, we made sure that all CNAs that were hired through the name base went back and fingerprint. They have the fingerprint. Did anybody, I told providers, anybody that's worked outside of the state the last five years needs to fingerprint. So, and it's, it's, it's good for you, it's going to protect you because we're going to know if something else comes up, we're going to continually monitor it and everything else. So they might be clear in Oklahoma, but they got, they were convicted in Oregon, they were convicted in Utah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That type of thing. And we also tell you, if you have an individual that's lived in Utah, you could go to Utah's site and check their registry. We're trying to get a CNA registry nationwide because a lot of folks move around. They get in trouble in Texas, they move to Oklahoma. They'll have abuse here and there and stuff. So they move around. So you need to find out if they've lived out of state and stuff. You know, they might say, well, I've, I've, I've lived in Oklahoma my whole life. And two weeks in, you know, they say, yeah, when I when I lived in Washington and da, 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 da. Well, you hear that, say, well, you never told me you lived in Washington. So they're pretty sneaky, pretty sneaky. And the biggest thing I hear is, I don't have anything in my record. This is, this is not me. And I get to talking to them and endure. Uh, the other big thing, the big thing was the shoplifting charge, especially. If I've heard it once, I've heard a hundred times. Well, I was with my cousin, my cousin put it in my purse and I didn't know it. I, I've heard that. I can't tell you how many times and stuff. So, and if they steal, if they, if they have an opportunity to steal, are they going to steal from, from your clients? And stuff. So, who has to be screened? People that have continued, if they work at the nursing home, they have to be screened. If you have a rehab individual coming routinely, they have to be screened. If you call an HVAC repair guy and he's coming to fix the HVAC, they don't have to be screened. It's continued, I think. Uh, uh, like hospice, they'll have a driver. They call me and say, look, we got a guy that all he does is deliver deliver oxygen. He sets the beds up at the homes. That's all they, he's going in the homes. He's giving them instruction how to do stuff. He has access to them, their financial, and everything else, unsupervised with nobody. I said, they have to be screened. So, uh, $19 can save you a whole lot. All right, any other questions before I leave? Okay, I do training for surveyors and, and I, we go more in depth and everything else. In the system, like I say, you have, you have a lot of different tabs where you can check stuff, pending payments, what's been paid, who's separated. You go in there and verify. You can also uh, print off a roster. You can, there's several different things you can do to go in and check stuff. And the applicant, a lot of them move around. So especially when, when we request additional information on a charge, the address in the system, because we, every letter we send to them, we send certified. And it's like $7 and something cent. And I'll only do that twice. After that, I, I won't send it anymore. But they have to sign for it. I'm trying to go to a different system where everybody will have to provide an email or maybe we can text them their letter to their phone. We're trying to come up with a secure way because I spend probably 50, $60,000 a year just on certified mail. And that would save, you know, we don't want to increase price and everything else for screening. But uh, it's their responsibility to notify you so you can update their address or even their name change. They get married, 
let us know. Send us the marriage certificate and we'll change the, the name in the system. And generally, they usually get a new social security card as well. So it has the same number, but a different name. And what if you have somebody from, um, we had this the other day, somebody was here on a visa, work visa. They don't have a, not a work, they're here on a visa, student visa, and they wanted to volunteer. They don't have a social security card because they're not working. So what do we do? So we have like a fictitious number. We can let you use to put them in. And then once it's done, we remove it. So, alrighty. I think you guys had like a 15 minute break. <laughs> I'm good, how are you? <laughs> Thank <clears throat> you. 